Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kun Fan. I'm a member of the Herbert Smith Freehill China International Business and Economic Law Center and Associate Professor at UNSW Law and Justice. I'm very delighted to welcome you all to our third session of CBEL's 2021 Young Scholars Workshop. I'll begin today by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the lands on which we meet today, the Betago and um, Garigo people from where UNSW stands, and pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. So I will now welcome you all to our session on the challenges and opportunities in international dispute settlement mechanism. International dispute settlement is now experiencing unprecedented challenges and a legitimacy crisis. Efforts for reform have been taken by various stakeholders to respond to public criticisms. So what are the challenges and opportunities in international dispute settlement mechanism today? In this panel, we will discuss a number of controversial issues facing international dispute settlement mechanism, from COVID-19 crisis and investment contract under the ICSA Convention, to human rights issues arising out of investor state arbitration, from corruption and bribery occurring between investor and public officials of the hosting state, to the applicability of the New York Convention to investment treaty arbitration awards. It will also explore some of the ISDS reform options, such as the dispute prevention mechanisms in ISDS and its implications for legal pluralism. So I will start to introduce each panelist just before they speak. And we will allow each panelist to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes before we open up for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions to our speakers, please feel free to post them in the Q&A um, section and we will try to address those questions in the end. So without further ado, I will start to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Chen Yu, a PhD graduate from McGill University Faculty of Law. Dr. Chen's research interests include international investment and trade law, international adjudication and international relations. She holds an LM degree from McGill and a Bachelor of Economic and Bachelor of Law from Nankai University. She has published in Exit Review and Journal of World Investment and Trade and also presented in various conferences. And starting this October, she will be joining uh, NUS Law as a postdoctoral fellow. Chen's topic today is dispute prevention mechanism in ISDS towards a plural investment law regime. Chen Yu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Fan, for introducing me, and thank you very much for having me today in this uh, Young Scholars Workshop. It is my pleasure to share with you my recent research, which is still in progress about dispute prevention mechanisms in investment dispute settlement. And I have to be honest that I initially envisaged this paper as a more theoretical one, as Professor Fan. Um, Discuss the, discussing the relationship between uh, dispute prevention and uh, legal pluralism, and as, but as I write it, I decided to make it more practical. So today in my presentation, I will uh, spend half of the time uh, talking about the theoretical aspect and another half of the time uh, on the more practical uh, aspects. Next slide, please. So I would like to first um, uh, give a, a brief introduction of the definition and uh, the different forms of DPM, which stands for dispute prevention mechanisms. Here I quote the definition provided by Ankhtat in one of its reports, which depicts dispute prevention and avoidance as involving minimizing potential errors of disputes through extensive planning in order to reduce the number of conflicts that escalate or crystallize. Uh, therefore, in my paper, DPM has a quite broad scope, which includes both dispute avoidance mechanisms at an early stage, such as uh, communication and negotiation with 
ombudsman or with uh, the local authority uh, and also legal capacity building measures. It also includes alternative dispute resolution uh, measures like mediation and conci uh, conciliation, which uh, can resolve disputes in a less expensive and less time consuming manner. And according to the proposed or the already implemented practice relating to DPMs, I categorize the possible regulatory frameworks into three modes. Uh, from starting from the bottom, uh, the first mode is what I call the local law mode, um, where each country have uh, designed its unique set of rules, institutions, uh, or procedures. Uh, for ombudsman under its administrative law framework. And this ombudsman may collect information, communicate with foreign investors, uh, improve the overall uh, legal environment, or uh, directly tackling investors' complaints. A typical example is a recently uh, implemented rules on handling complaints of foreign invested enterprises uh, by China. Uh, which requires different levels of government to de designate its own agency to handle foreign investors' complaints. And if the investor is not satisfied with the result of complaint handling of a lower uh, agency, it may report the issue to a higher level of agency. Another example is Korea's Office of the Foreign Investment Ombudsman, which is a more centralized form of dispute prevention mechanism as the institution is directly commissioned by the president. And the second mode is what I call the treaty mode. For example, the treaty parties may establish a specialized institution and procedures uh, for the purpose of DPM, or they may spe specify uh, rules and procedures for mediation or consultation. Of, of an example of the former is the famous uh, cooperation and the facilitation investment agreement that is a CFIA uh, developed by Brazil. Uh, it has has been uh, ser it has served as a model model for uh, investment treaties in Latin America and other countries as well. Uh, and an uh, example of the latter is uh, is a CETA which has uh, specific rules on mediation and the conciliation. And the, the third mode is what I call the multilateral cooperation. And sorry for the typo here. Uh, in, in the Ancestral Working Group through discussion, some uh, countries have discussed the possibility of uh, having uh, this a multilateral advisory center and letting this center to uh, serve c capacity building and prevent investment disputes. And besides, I think international organizations like ANSICHUA and ICSIT can also work on developing uh, model laws uh, for model clauses for uh, states that are interested in uh, having this um, dispute prevention mechanism in investment treaties. Or they can also develop the model laws uh, guiding um, states administrative law uh, if they are interested in establishing their own ombudsman locally. And next slide, please. So why has uh, DPMs attracted so much attention in Ancestral Working Group 3 discussion? And why are they so important for investment law reform in the recent uh, Ancestral Working Group three submissions states have uh, have highlighted several advantages of DPMs. Um, to start with, it facilitates communication not only uh, between the foreign investor and the uh, uh, regulatory authority of the host state, but can also facilitate communication between different levels of government within the host state, or even uh, the communication between the host state and the home state. And also through this uh, dispute prevention process, this practice, the local authorities of the ho host states can gain a better understanding of uh, relevant rules and procedures uh, so that they can avoid violating these rules in their future regulatory activities. And most importantly, uh, DPM 
uh, compared to investment arbitration saves time and cost. And we all know that investment arbitration is a uh, quite lengthy and and costly procedure. Um, what I would like to highlight here is the theoretical value of DPM. That is, it contributes to the uh, realization of a plural investment law regime. So why is uh, pluralism important for investment law at the current stage? Currently, international community uh, really lacks shared understandings of um, the key uh, le legal obligations relating to foreign investment protection. Although we say that the BITs have similar structures, but um, uh, the detailed rules regarding key investment uh, protection obligations like fair and equitable treatment are actually quite different among different treaties. And moreover, the expectations of the outcome of the current investment law reform, uh, which can, can be observed from states on central working group three submissions, are also quite diversified. For example, some states highlight that uh, substantive issues should be addressed in on central working group three, but, uh, but this task was not actually undertaken by uh, the working group three currently. And uh, lastly, since political power and legal capacity are quite imbalanced among states, a plural approach ensures that the demands and understandings of different states are equally respected and it avoids letting a single political actor or a judicial body to dominate investment lawmaking. From this, perspect uh, this perspective, DPMs contribute to the realization of a plural investment law in that it provides a decentralized dispute settlement framework. In other words, it does not rely on investment tribunals to be the main body of dispute settlement. In this sense, this, the DPM also limits the influence of investment tribunals on state re domestic regulations because it can be expected to reduce the cases sent to investment tribunals. And lastly, compared to arbitration, it provides states um, uh, um, cheaper, uh, more friendly and more efficient avenue uh, to practice investment law to uh, reinforce their understandings of the relevant rules and states may uh, further reflect on their current uh, investment protection policies and decide whether they want to modify them in future investment treaties. So next slide, please. And lastly, I would like to discuss some uh, practical but also important issues relating to the institutional design of DPMs. Due to time, uh, time limits, uh, I will just quickly explain them here without further elaboration. So firstly, I think it is desirable for state to uh, specify either in investment treaties or in their local administrative laws uh, to uh, uh, regarding the standards to treat foreign investors in their uh, DPM procedures. Here I've listed uh, uh, standards like non-discrimination, good faith, absence of harassment and coercion, uh, which are actually ele elements that are frequently found by tribunals to violate fair and equitable treatment. And secondly, I argue that uh, DPM should not be used as a means to politicize investment dispute settlement. I'm talking about this because uh, I think this is how it is used in Brazil's CFIA. The whole process in Brazil's CFIA is dominated by states. For example, uh, it, if the a DPM fails, uh, disputes will be resolved by state state arbitration and uh, uh, the process is initiated um, through a home state submission of the notification rather than the investor itself submitting the notification. And uh, another issue is uh, whether DPM should be introduced mandatorily or as a voluntary requirement. Uh, on one hand, mandatory can a uh, mandatory DPM can facilitate the usage of the mechanisms and uh, improve the chance of dispute 
prevention. However, uh, if if the DPM is not as effective as expected, compelling investors to use them may just uh, unnecessarily prolong the whole process. And the, the next problem is about mediation and government accountability. Uh, I think Professor um, Fan also discussed in, in one of her paper that an uh, important reason why mediation is not widely used by states is that they have concerns that their citizens will know that they are making compromise with foreign investors. So in light of this kind of concerns, should we uh, allow them to allow allow like uh, local also local communities to join this mediation process? This will just prolong the whole a mediation process which is at odds with the initial goal of having DPM. And lastly is how to incorporate uh, DPM into ISDS. So I'm uh, running out of my, my time. I will just uh, wrap up here. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shen Yu, for the very interesting and timely presentation, especially at a time when there are urgent calls for ISDS reform and many are actually looking for um, you know, options uh, of dispute prevention. And interestingly, China has also recently led to the establishment of the International Commercial Dispute Prevention and Settlement Organization, which is intended to resolve both commercial and investment disputes. And uh, in the proposed rule, it actually also emphasized dispute prevention and proposed that the Secretary General actually discharge the duty of good offices of the organization. So it would be interesting to follow the trend as Chen Yu has mentioned and to observe how those initiatives might evolve in practice. I'm sure we have more questions to so come back to you later during the Q&A. And now I would like to move to our second speaker, um, Mr. Raymond Gao, who is a PhD scholar from Australian National University. Um, Mr. Gao is a PhD scholar focusing on transnational data governance, investment law, international arbitration, trade law, geoeconomics, and comparative information and privacy. His scholarship has been widely published, including Columbia Journal of Transnational Law, Tsinghua China Law Review, among others. And today, um, his topic is human rights in investment treaty arbitration. So Raymond, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction. I'm very glad to be here to uh, talk about one of my most recent work in progress, Human Rights in Investment Treaty Arbitration. So uh, in Dr. Chen's presentation, she talked about dispute prevention mechanism, focus on the procedure reform of international investment law. And in my presentation, I will talk more about the substantive law aspect, especially the relationship between human rights and investment treaty arbitration. I hope this can uh, contribute a different angle to this panel's discussion. So uh, in this regard, as noted by many commentators, investment treaty arbitration is increasingly challenging human rights in the whole state. Uh, this is so-called normative conflict between human rights and investment treaty arbitration has been at the core of international investment law's legitimacy crisis. Next slide, please. So um, under this topic, my work in progress, or last slide, sorry. Under this topic, my um, work in progress deal with three major questions. First, what are the so-called normative conflict? And second, how the application of international human rights law in investment treaty arbitration can address this conflict? And finally, what are the limitations of, of this approach? And in response, um, how should the investment treaties be reformed to provide potential solutions? Given my limited time, I can only give a very brief and general overview and some notable examples in order to uh, give you a taste of what it is. So next slide, please. The first question is, what are the normative conflict? In short, in investment treaty arbitration, a whole state is increasingly caught in a binary dilemma, forcing it to choose between in investors' rights or human rights. And this has been shown in four major aspects. First, regulatory chills. Investment treaty arbitration may interfere with the sovereign right of the whole state to regulate public interests and human rights. And this can happen directly, 
through formal investment claims or indirectly through the threats of such claims in secret negotiations. And second, the diversion effects of investment awards. Investment treaty arbitration, if an investor wins, the tribunal might award, might render a award uh, that is, that has obliged the state to pay an expensive sum of compensation to the foreign investors. So this might spend the uh, taxpayers' money which could have been used to advance human rights in the first place. And this tension, if anything, only becomes more pressing for a developing country with modest financial revenues and material means, or experiencing a national um, emergency such as the current COVID-19. Next slide, please. And also the current investment treaty system is preoccupied with state responsibility. In contrast, investors' conduct, misconduct, and wrongdoing are left at the margin. And this produced a bit, um, you know, sort of an unbalanced system. Of course, domestic law institution of the whole state can play a role to address this misconduct of the investors. But this approach has its own limitations. And finally, the investment case law. Some tribunals have developed a very expensive approach to um, state responsibility and investor protection. Given that many early investment treaties are usually short, vague, and full of different gaps, such an interpretive presumption may stack the deck in favor of the investor at the cost of the public interest in the whole state. And also, this may lead tribunals to disregard or sidestep human rights of the whole state's local population rather than take them seriously. Next slide, please. So let's look at the legal solutions. The current literature increasingly coalesces around what I term as a constellation of public law prescriptions, including devising a proportionality test, recalibrating the standard of review, or according a notion of deference to the regulatory measures of the whole state, and join public law analogies and principles developed under national domestic law. But in contrast, a public international law dimension is often overlooked. Next slide, please. So um, in my article, I try to explore a public international approach to address this conflict. Importantly, investment treaty dispute is a process where the investor mostly bases claim on international law, invoke investment treaties to establish state responsibility. So in general, international law serves as the substantive law governing the merits of the dispute. And human rights law as part of general international law may become the applicable law to investment treaty disputes. And specifically, I explore three different rules of human rights law. First, the whole state can raise affirmative defense based on human rights to defend themselves against state responsibility. And this includes three major different arguments, jurisdiction or admissibility defense, compensation defense, and conflict of norms defense. Second, human rights law could be invoked to uh, raise counterclaims to enforce external investor duties and obligations under international law, including human rights law. And finally, human rights law can serve as interpretive tools to balance investor protection in the process of treaty interpretation. Next slide, please. As I don't have time to uh, go through all of them, I will only talk about some notable examples. So first, let's look at affirmative defense number one which is jurisdiction and admissibility defense. The basis of this is the legality requirements. Many investment treaties provide foreign investments should be made in conformity with or in accordance with the law of the whole state, either in the definition of foreign investments or in other substantive provisions. And tribunal in practice tend to construe this provision as suggesting the treaty party's consent to exclude illegal investment from the treaty's protection. Next slide, please. And even though such an express legality provision exists in treaties, 
some investment tribunals have found an implicit obligation to the same effect under general international law, which requires foreign investment shall be made in accordance with the law of the whole state and some rules of international law. And to be clear, investment tribunal have not required investors compliance with international law as a general matter, but instead their analysis usually focus on the principle of good faith, which itself is a fundamental principle of international law. Next slide, please. And so far, investment tribunal have mostly invoked these implicit legality requirements in the context of fraud or corruption to deny an investment treaty's protection for investment that were illegally obtained through fraudulent or deceptive conduct or corruption and bribery. But what about the other scenarios? And in the paper, I argue that this approach could be extended to violation of substantive international law including human rights law and environmental norms. This is because any serious violation of substantive international legal obligation can equally violate the principle of good faith. And from a policy perspective, there's no good reason to prioritize one violation of the law over another. So just like investment obtained through corruption, bribery or fraud, investment made in serious violation of the human rights in the whole state could equally be deprived of an investment treaty's protection. Next slide, please. And what about the condition for invoking these legality requirements? Well, tribunal generally agree that the legality should refer to the timing when the investment is established or made. They have not agree on the nature and extent of the illegality, and there are different approaches. And among them, I argue that the proportionality test seems to be better because it's more transparent, coherent and principles and it could enable tribunals to balance investment protection with the necessity of sanctioning illegal investments by way of a, a proportionality test. So by applying these legality requirements, tribunal might decline treaty protection for investment made in serious violation of the human rights. Next slide, please. And next, let's look at the compensation defense. Under general international law, there is this contributory fault doctrine. So basically, if a victim's faulty contribution has materially led to its own injury, then the damage awarded may be reduced accordingly in proportionate to its willful or negligent contribution. And in investment treaty arbitration, uh, tribunals have increasingly relied on this doctrine to give effects to investors wrongdoing that in part cause its own injury and cut the damages in different ratios. For, for example, in these cases, uh, the tribunal have um, reduced the damage awarded in proportionate to the um, willful or negligent contribution of the investor to their own injury. Next slide, please. And also, in addition to breaches of domestic law, contributory fault could equally be applied to address investors' wrongdoing or human rights. For example, in Copper Mercer, the tribunal uh, have found the investors hiring of local agents to engage in criminal activities significantly contributed to its own injury and thus reduced the uh, damage by 30%. And finally, in Bear Creek, the Dissenting arbitrator Philip Sand found the investors' failure to obtain a social license to operate, which is a soft law obligation under international human rights law, had significantly contributed to the social unrest, which triggered the disputed measure in the first place. So uh, arbitrator Sand found the investor equally liable as the whole state and cut the damages by half. And this case is demonstrating the potential of invoking the doctrine of contributory fault to sanction investor misconduct regarding human rights. But this approach has its own limitations. One of the major ones concerns human rights law itself, because human rights law is primarily addressed to states rather than private individuals. In principle, human rights law do not impose obligations on investors, so it might be difficult to invoke human rights law directly to enforce investor duties, either through legality requirements or the contributory fault. And in response, 
new, new investment treaty can provide investing obligations either in one way or another. I hope I can talk more about my time is limited, so I will leave it here and welcome comments and questions in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Raymond, for the very insightful presentations. We suppose that uh, privatization of public services such as water, energy, and undoubtedly we're going to see more human rights issues arising in investment arbitration. I think your paper rightly pointed to the normative conflicts between ISDS and human rights and the asymmetric nature of investment treaties. Um, we already started to see some trends occurring in some recent treaty and model clauses, um, introducing a more tenable link between business human rights and investment treaty instruments. So I think it will be interesting to actually observe whether the state will incorporate the more um, progressive features in the forthcoming treaty negotiation and how foreign investor might respond to those instruments. Um, I do have some questions. I might come back to you later, um, but thank you so much for the presentation. And we will now move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Lucas Clover um, um, Alcolia, um, who just recently completed his doctoral in civil law at McGill University under the supervision of Professor Fabian Gilinas and will be working as a postdoctoral associate in the Scheinman Institute of Conflict Resolution at Cornell from August. He has written several articles on trust arbitration and investment law, and his doctor thesis is due to publish by um, Edward Algar Publishing in spring, so congratulations for that. Um, Lucas also completed various trainingship in different law firms in Zurich, Paris, and Geneva, in the areas of private client law and international arbitration. His topic today is COVID-19 crisis and investment contract under the ICSID Convention, force majeure and hardship revisited. Lucas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so this is a pretty broad topic, so I may have to, to rush this slightly and I won't be able to cover everything in the depth that I would like, but I still hope that it's interesting. Um, and I do touch on some of the issues to do with good faith and the interaction between international and domestic law that have been mentioned by the other speakers. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, so there are some basically the economic and the health consequences of COVID-19 are fairly well known. Um, many of these figures, I would say, are still relevant despite the vaccine, given the changing messages from governments and concerns about how effective or not they might be. Um, and of course, there will be some sectors that will take years to recover. The hospitality sector, the aviation sector, will all, it will not be even with a vaccine, it will be three or four years down the line. Uh, so it's still a very, I mean, I'm sure we're all aware it's still a very present uh, crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So I've just tried to outline um, a couple of the investment disputes that I am aware of so far that might outrise um, out of the crisis. And the first one, is uh, the Group ADP case, which is probably what I would think of as the paradigm case, which is to do with uh, the aviation sector. It's an airport concession in Chile, um, and they want to renegotiate the contract, and the government doesn't want to do it. And you'd think there'd be a lot more of these cases, uh, but for some reason, there aren't. But it'd be very interesting to see that happens, because as it's clear, it's one of the most affected sectors. Uh, the second is probably the most interesting one, which is the Mexican renewable energy reform. Uh, this is a less obvious case of an industry affected by COVID-19. Uh, but the justifications taken by Mexico's independent grid operator, although query how independent it is of the government, are interesting. They argue that given multiple disconnections, uh, overloads, and I think the technical term is electrical oscillations caused by renewable energy plants, they're too unreliable to be trusted during the pandemic. And that's why they have stopped prioritizing renewable energy and they started prioritizing fossil fuels. Um, and it's difficult to know whether this argument will hold up under scrutiny. And the last one is the, the uh, suspension of the toll road system, I believe, in Lima, in Peru. And this was effectively the argument was, well, individuals shouldn't have to pay a toll during the sanitary emergency. And um, that's actually been suspended by the Constitutional Court in Peru. So we'll see whether it goes to investment dispute or not, but they had put in uh, notice of a dispute. Next slide, please. So the issue of choice of law, uh, I think that sometimes we underestimate it, given that there are um, I mean, you, you have contract law in all systems, but the, the system of contract law is very, very different. So German based systems will have pre contractual liability, for example, common law systems do not. And civilian legal systems and international contractual instruments, uh, as was mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about the duty of good faith. 
and Nigel Shaw quite famously doesn't. So in the context of COVID-19, defences for non or defective performance differ significantly among jurisdictions. So frustration, which I will deal with shortly, is very different doctrine from force majeure, which doesn't exist in English law. Uh, and it's even more different from hardship, which also doesn't exist in English law. So the chosen law will have a significant impact on the consequences of non or defective performance, which is where the, the choice of law angle comes in. Next slide, please. So in the exit convention, the issue of choice of law is regulated by Article 42. Um, and I'm only going to deal with the issue, the situation where the parties have made an explicit choice of law. It's also very interesting with the implied choice of law, where they haven't made choice of law, but in the interest of time, I'll only deal with the situation where they've made an explicit choice. Next slide, please. And there are several issues which I've listed. Um, I won't be able to deal with all of them for, for obvious reasons, but I want to focus on what I think are the most interesting ones. Uh, which is, is international law part of domestic law. Um, and the argument here is that international law is part of domestic law in many legal systems. Uh, there are some legal systems which even have a constitutional requirement to be in conformity or to, to apply international law directly. And arbitral tribunals applying domestic law uh, might still, must apply international law. And the issues with this argument, I, I think, are, are twofold. Firstly, you can think of the English legal system where customer international law is only applicable if it's incorporated by the courts and treaties are only applicable after an act of parliament. And secondly, even in those legal systems where international law is directly applicable, uh, there may be limitations on how far that can go. Um, and the second uh, interesting question is, does international law play a corrective role when interpreting national law? Uh, so this came from the ruling of the Klockner Annulment Committee. Um, which, where the tribunal stated that international law played a corrective role where the state's law did not conform in all points to the principles of international law. And the, the issue with this view in the contractual context is that it's difficult to say that there is an international law of contract as such. And even if there is, it's difficult to say it can legitimately sweep away national law. So here we come again back to the choice of law issues. So, sorry to belabor the point, but in English law, we don't have a principle of good faith. Uh, but in the unit of our principles of commercial contracts, the UN Convention of Sale of Goods, and so on, all of them have a contract, have a, a doctrine of good faith. So, could you say, well, we're going to correct <laughs> English law and other common law systems and introduce a principle of good faith when you're looking at a concessions contract? Uh, and I think that'd be a difficult argument to make, given that parties uh, overwhelmingly choose uh, English and common law uh, to govern their contracts. In many cases, it'd be a very uh, difficult argument to make. And it's, another issue is. Uh, what do we even, when we say what would even be, do uniform contract instruments constitute international law? This is an argument that's often made. Well, we do have an international law contract because we can look at the unit of principles. But the problem is that there isn't just the unit of principles. There's also the principles of European contract law, uh, what is now the draft common fate the reference. There's UN Convention on International Sale of Goods, and there's also a Latin American principles of contract law. And they all say slightly different things. So. There clearly isn't in certain respects, there isn't an international law of contract. So it's clear that domestic law and choice of law takes quite a serious importance. And this is what I've tried to kind of illustrate when looking at concession contracts and which law has been chosen, and specifically the excuse doctrines um, to excuse not performance of the contracts in the context of COVID-19. Next slide, please. So probably the most well-known excuse doctrine uh, is that of force majeure. And this is derived from Roman law and exists in civil law systems and also international law, but it doesn't exist in common law systems. And as noted on the slides, the conditions for a successful claim are that a party has not performed or has not performed adequately due to an event which is external, unforeseeable and irresistible. And the consequences of a successful claim of force majeure are the extinction of the contractual obligations and a release for the debtor from any liability for breach of contract. And this extinction and release can be temporary or permanent, depending on the circumstances of the case. Um, and today, I'm not aware that it's been successfully pleaded with relation to COVID-19 uh, outside of um, contracts. That's a very different situation when you put in a specific contractual clause. You can actually, for example, say you know, an epidemic constitutes what's mature, and you can list separate uh, requirements from the default doctrine. But the default doctrine itself, uh, I'm not aware that it's always going to be kind of successful thing, for sure. Uh, next slide, please. So frustration um, is a very different doctrine, and it was developed by the common law in the mid-1800s. 
effectively to deal, to get over the inability of the common law to accept subsequent impossibilities. So where a subsequent event had happened, it made a contract impossible to perform, it wasn't previously possible in, in common law to escape your obligation to perform that. And it applies where an unforeseen radical change in the circumstances in which a contract is to be formed makes it impossible that the contract be performed as agreed by the parties. And a successful plea of frustration releases the parties from having to perform any future contractual obligations. And the bar is set higher than for force majeure because it actually requires impossibility, uh, which force majeure does not. Next slide, please. So hardship is, is a very different doctrine from both force majeure and frustration. Um, and it's hard to say exactly what it is because unlike force majeure frustration, it isn't uniform across uh, many different legal systems. But you can speak of a common uh, core where a hardship arises due to events in the course of contractual performance, which lead to disequilibrium between the contracting parties. And this was actually the argument that was made um, in the Chilean case I mentioned, that they said that because of the change in the conditions caused by the lower number of planes, that there was a disequilibrium in the contract between them and the, the Chilean government to operate the airport concession. Um, and as I've said, it's quite important to note that in general, uh, contractual agreements, clauses, have overridden the default provisions of the law um, in hardship and in force mature, obviously not frustration, uh, for reasons that will become clear. Next slide, please. And for that reason, I've actually analyzed um, certain concession contracts and looked at what they say. And the one on the screen comes from a production sharing agreement between Uganda and Tolo Uganda Limiting. And you'll see that it's highlighted that it actually explicitly provides an epidemic can amount to force majeure. And in general, the greater includes the lesser. So it's likely that epidemic would include pandemic. And so COVID-19 would come within the scope of the clause. But there are the other requirements of the clause, um, as with the general law. The other party must be unable wholly or in part to carry out its obligation. So the mere fact that there is an epidemic doesn't excuse you from having to perform your obligations unless it actually prevents you from doing it. And in the case of an oil field, uh, it's a bit difficult to see necessarily how an epidemic would prevent this unless there's an epidemic on site um, or the government actually you know, ordered production to stop something like this. So it's not just because you have an epidemic clause in your contract doesn't mean that you are immediately you know, free if you have any problems. You really still have to prove it. Next slide, please. And so this is a, a sample hardship clause. Actually, there is quite a long slide. So, um, so we'll probably go on to the next slide as well. And then the, the next slide as well. So you can see that it's much more detailed than a force majeure clause. Uh, and this was just a short extract for about three or four pages dealing with it. Um, and the contract explicitly outlines who is to bear what risks. And this is dealt with in clause 20, which I haven't included because it ran to several pages. So you can see that hardship is very much more a contractually dominated doctrine than either frustration or, or force majeure. And the question that this sort of clause raises is what room is left for the default doctrines of hardship or force majeure? Can you seriously say that any event is unforeseeable if you spent three or four pages listing all of the different sorts of situations which might arise and allocating the risk? Uh, last, uh, next slide. Even. So I think what I've tried to do in very whirlwind tour is show that there are very different default, different default doctrines and different clauses. So choice of law actually has quite an important uh, effect on the outcomes of a case, let's say. And my, you know, the reason that I keep referring back to the idea of not letting kind of international law govern everything is the outcomes of domestic law are very different. So it isn't necessarily possible for an arbitrator for something deciding just to go with um, the international law position because the domestic law position is very, very different. And that's really where contract law comes into play. Um, and I think this is one of the risks of when you have international arbitration, when you're dealing with a concession contract and an investment claim, is that arbitrators will just overemphasize the international law without necessarily looking into what may be very different national law provisions. Um, and that's, of course, you know, when you run into the idea of saying national law incorporates international law, this usually just becomes a way of directly applying international law. So it's important to see what the clauses say and to see what the choice of law says and to pick a legal system that, for example, this maybe makes it a lower bar, uh, particularly with COVID-19. And that concludes my presentation. And thanks all for listening.
Thank you so much, Lucas, for the great presentation. Um, so uh, undoubtedly, COVID-19 will continue to be disruptive to business, and I guess forced merger clauses and hardship clauses may still be often invoked um, to seek relief from obligation due to the COVID-19 impact. But the full impact of COVID-19 on investment arbitration remains to be seen. X actually just re recently released the case law statistics for 2021. There are 70 new cases registered, a new record with 332 administered during the year. So I'd be curious to see how many of those cases actually relied on force majeure and hardship clauses and how many defenses actually succeeded. Uh, but I think Lucas' paper very timely pointed out to the uncertainties caused by the conflict in views regarding the approach of um, applicable laws um, to the investment contract and also the importance of carefully drafting the choice of law clauses, which is often neglected. I'm sure we have more questions to Lucas. Um, we'll probably come back to him um, later. Um, but now I will move on to our next speaker, um, Ms. Yue Zhao, um, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Geneva. Ms. Zhao holds also an LM degree from the same university and an MPhil degree from Renmin University. She's conducting research on commercial arbitration, investment arbitration, and comparative private law under the supervision of Professor Gabriel Kaufman Collar. And Yue contributed to the fifth volume of the ECA report series and also the Compendium of Chinese Commercial Arbitration Laws and the Yearbook Commercial Arbitration 2021. She was granted John State International Fellowship, OMM Scholarship, and also proceeding with her research at the UNIDUA. Yue's topic today is commercial reservation, um, a New York Convention's applicability to investment treaty arbitration awards. Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor uh, Fan. Um, I think that in the field of commercial arbitration, no one can deny the practical significance of a New York Convention. And since a long time, the applicability of the New York Convention to investment treaty arbitration has been regarded as a uh, undisputed assertion. We can find a lot of scholarly writings stating that the recognition and enforcement of the investor state arbitration awards are governed by two international instruments, the Exit Convention and the New York Convention. But with more and more cases, we're entering into domestic courts in the jurisdictional and post award stage. There has been increasing doubt about the compatibility of the New York Convention with the investment treaty arbitration uh, awards. So in the following minutes, I will briefly review different court opinions on this issue and discuss why we have this kind of dispute. And uh, hopefully we still have time to deal with this question. Next slide, please. Let's, let us start from um, the provisions of the New York Convention that, has, that are relevant to this issue. The first one is Article 1, Paragraph 1. It's a general introduction to the scope of application of New York Convention. It says that the New York Convention applies to arbitration awards arising out of differences between persons, whether physical or legal. Today, the overriding opinion is that legal persons include state entities. But if we read through the legislative history of the New York Convention, we can easily find that back to the time of the adoption of the New York Convention, the clear consensus between the delegate was that legal entities only include states acting in private capacity. So that is one reason today we still have dispute about whether investor state dispute can be included in the New York Convention. The second relevant provision is a commercial reservation on uh, Article 1, Paragraph 3. It allows some states to um, apply the New York Convention to differences, to commercial differences defined according to their own national law. So based on Article 1, Paragraph 1, some states define commercial as a kind of business related relationship between private parties and other states, they don't have such restrictions. So based on these two provisions, we have also dispute about the applicability of the New York Convention. Next slide, please. Uh, a lot of states have made commercial reservation and they hold divergent opinions about commerciality of ISDS. Um, the affirmative opinion is supported by the ancestral model law. 
And we can find US and Canadian calls almost unanimously confirm the commercial nature of ISDS. For example, in the Crystalex case, the Canadian court generally categorized dispute arising under uh, uh, BITs as commercial. And in all these cases, we can find neither US nor Canadian courts inquired into the nature of the state party's behavior. Next slide, please. And we can also find uh, negative opinions. The first one is from the Chinese court in as early as 1987. Uh, a Chinese Supreme Court issued an opinion uh, right after China's uh, concession into the New York Convention. It states that investor state disputes are non-commercial. So that includes investors treaty arbitration from the scope of application from the New York Convention. And rather recently, the Daily High Court in India also denied the commerciality of investor state disputes in the wonderful case. Um, the court concluded that the Arbitration and the Conciliation Act in India did not apply because the investment treaty arbitration was grounded on state guarantees and assurance and rooted in public international law, obligations of state and administrative law. So that implied that New York Convention incorporated in the Arbitration and the Conciliation Act will not be ap applicable to investor treaty, investor state arbitration. Next slide, please. We know that in the early state, uh, in the early days of investor state arbitration, this kind of arbitration borrowed procedure and a structure from commercial arbitration. So very naturally, commercial uh, investor state arbitration is considered as a special category of commercial arbitration. However, the commercial arbitration paradigm brought a lot of concerns about ISDS. As we, we all know, we have, for example, the inconsistency concern, the ignorance of the regulatory need of the host state, and the lack of transparency, etc. So more recently, scholars such as, for example, Guzman Hadden and Stephen Chales, they observe ISDS from the lens of comparative and international public law. And it is surprising uh, surprising that the public law paradigm it aims to enhance the investment treaty arbitration mechanism, but by distinguishing investment arbitration from commercial arbitration, that lead to a lot of states' conclusion that uh, investment arbitration is non-commercial and is undercard the universal enforceability of arbitration awards by denying the applicability of New York Convention based on the commercial reservation. Uh, the public facet of ISDS can be summarized to three points. Today, we do not have time to review all these points uh, one by one, but it's noteworthy that the public facet of investment treaty arbitration is not a purely academic discussion. And uh, as we all know, in the high profile case, UCAS versus Russia, in both the arbitral proceedings and uh, the post award stages, Russian's argument is based on the public law features of ISDS and its distinction with commercial arbitration. So with more and more public law features of ISDS being emphasized, it is necessary to understand that ISDS is not a purely public law mechanism. In other words, the public law facet is only one side of coin. Well, since decades, we believe that commercial uh, a facet of ISDS remains only on the procedure perspective. That means uh, since investment treaty arbitration is procedurally similar to commercial arbitration, so it can be regarded as commercial arbitration mechanism. But uh, ISDS does have some substantive commerciality. Next slide, please. Indeed, we all know that ISDS is about regulatory dispute, but all the regulatory disputes arise from the process of investing. And international investment treaties are not designed as an administrative law mechanism, but are designed to impose uh, obligations on host state governments regarding the disposition of private rights in property, contracts, enterprises, and other kinds of commitments of capacity, uh, 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 of money, of money and um, uh, uh, and monetary claims. So, in this aspect, 
international investment treaties and ISDS can be assimilated to a kind of internationalized or global private law system. And at that point of investor state arbitration has been long term underdeveloped from an academic perspective. So uh, we can very briefly summarize here that ISDS is a hybrid regime and its characterization or its paradigm is usually a choice based on functionalism. Instead of concluding that ISDS is public or commercial, it might be more sensible to think about the con context and objective of such kind of characterization, which means that in which context we are doing uh, such kind of characterization. And in the meaning of the New York Convention, to serve the end of recognition and enforcement, the adaptable approach is to consider investor treaty or investment treaty arbitration as commercial. Next slide, please. Well, this characterization is at first a pragmatic solution. Investor state arbitration being a mechanism in which a private party can bring direct actions against the host state for damages. The New York Convention will continue to be a useful instrument for recognition and enforcement. And the realistic problem for Chinese and Indian court is that after excluding the New York Convention from investment treaty arbitration, how to find a substitute mechanism? If there are other enforcement instruments in domestic law, other grounds for review substantially different from those under Article 5 of the New York Convention? If the answer is yes, we have a reason to ask if Chinese and Indian courts are going to review the merits of investment treaty arbitration awards in the recognition and enforcement stage, which is contrary to the common sense in arbitral pr practice. And if the answer is no, we cannot see any reason why New York Convention should be abandoned. So the question is not simply whether to apply the New York Convention, but if the status quo of the recognition and enforcement is going to be retained. And as I discussed, confirming the commerciality of investment treaty arbitration does not mean uh, I will deny the public law paradigm of investment arbitration uh, of investment arbitration. Investment arbitration is a special mixed mechanism, and now the crux is how to accommodate the peculiarities of investment arbitration in the applicability of the New York Convention. For example, how to reconcile uh, the state uh, sovereignty with Article 4 and how to apply Article 5, especially Article 5, Paragraph 1a, because as we all know that state consent is in nature's uh, a sovereign act which has to be maybe scrutinized by uh, both arbitral tribunals and domestic court more carefully. So the challenge here is not the applicability of the New York Convention, but should be the application of the New York Convention. We still have some other issues to discuss about ISDS reform, but I don't think I have time. But uh, I will say that with the ISDS reforms in, uh, continue. We will have more debate about the applicability of the New York Convention, and hopefully that someday we can come back and continue this discussion. Thank you. That's all. Thank you so much Yue, for the uh, very interesting presentation. I think you uh, actually brings a quite interesting perspective and highlighted the revolving door between the private and public approach to the understanding of investment um, treaty arbitration. And also I'm quite curious, you know, how the I say a reform might influence the applicability of the New York Convention in terms of this commercial reservation. So we might come back to that if we have time um, later. And now I would like to uh, move to our last speaker, um, Ms. Dr. Yue Ming Yan, um, who I think I believe recently de defended her doctor's thesis at McGill University Faculty of Law and is also um, upcoming the Global PhD Fellow at Singapore International Dispute Resolution Academy at Singapore Management University. Um, her research area cover international investment law and arbitration, China's law, arbitration, comparative law, and empirical legal studies. She has published several articles on anti-corruption investment law, including at the Journal of International Economic Law, the Rootless Rule of Law in China Comparative Perspective Series, and etc. Yue Ming also holds a Master's of Law degree from Xiamen University and a Bachelor of Law degree from uh, Zhongnan University of Economics and Law in China. Her topic today is Rethinking International Investment Governance of Transnational Economic Crime, 
a new understanding based on the global governance theory. Yue Ming, please. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Fan, for your kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Fion and Wen and other CBEL uh, team members for organizing this wonderful event. You have done many amazing work. Thank you. Um, for today's presentation, uh, I will introduce the relationship between uh, international investment law and transnational economic crimes, particularly um, anti-corruption. Uh, next slide, please. So for today's presentation, I will first um, give a brief background on the corruption claims in invest investment arbitration, and then I will introduce the existing uh, jurisprudence uh, of this legal issue. I will also discuss the roles of investor state arbitration in terms of combating transnational corruption. Next slide, please. So in investor state arbitration, it is uh, a very typical uh, scenario is that the investor, uh, it is the whole state that raised um, a claim, a corruption claim before the tribunal. Um, this corruption claim is invoked as a defense against investors claim of treaty or contract obligation violations. Let me take uh, illegal, alleged illegal expropriation uh, without compensation as an example here. So host, host states usually request ISA tribunals to dismiss investors' claims, arguing that this investment was actually was um, obtained by corrupt means and such uh, an investment uh, such established is outside the treaty protection. Um, as such, I, you can see here, there are two alleged illi uh, illegal acts. The first alleged illegal act is a treaty obligation claimed by investor, and the second alleged illegality is alleged corrupt acts between the representative of the investor and the public officials of the whole state. The chart on the left side illustrates the total number and the change of uh, ISA cases where corruption claims were raised. As you can see, uh, ISA tribunals are increasingly uh, addressing corruption related issues. Uh, and so far, there are around 50 cases, uh, but the blue line illustrates, denotes the total number of proved corrupt, uh, corruption cases. Uh, as you can see, there are um, a large number of cases uh, where the alleged corrupt acts between the investor and public officials of the host states were not substantiated. And so far, there are only four cases where corruption claims uh, were successful. That is world duty free, a mental tax, spend tax, and one, of, uh, one very recent one, Litop versus Uzbekistan, uh, whose awards were uh, issued uh, in 2021. And all among all these four successful corruption cases, uh, the tribunals seems to uh, adopt, adopt a consistent approach to deal with um, a whole state's investor uh, corruption claims, that is to completely deny investors um, claims. And in other words, uh, the, the, the tribunal did not uh, continue the proceedings and they just stopped here and all the investors' claims were dismissed. Um, next slide, please. So this kind of approach is defined as binary approach, and that is if corruption is substantiated, investors' claims dismissed, otherwise the proceedings uh, uh, continues. But the binary approach, in fact, has generated mounting criticism. The first type of criticism is um, imbalanced liabilities for corruption. It, uh, the um, corruption has an inherent bilateral nature. Uh, both supply side and demand side are illegal. And the supply side here is given a bribe. Most in the typical cases, it was an uh, investor who uh, gives a bribe to the public officials of the whole state. And the demand side here is the whole state. As you can see, the result after uh, because uh, the result of a binary approach is here the investor their claims are all thrown out and they lose the bribe and they lose the investment but 
uh, host state, they not only keep the bribe, but also um, they keep the investment. So this kind of imbalanced uh, liabilities for corruption has generated uh, many uh, amounting criticisms. Uh, Raymond just mentioned that the legality requirement uh, has been used to, to, to address corruption issue. That is the case in um, in World Duty Free and or uh, that is the case in the Mandel Tech versus Uzbekistan. But I hold uh, an opposite opinion that I believe it, legality requirements should not uh, be used to address corruption related issues. One of the reasons is, is because of this bilat bilateral nature of corrupt acts, which is totally different from the unilateral act uh, of violating like human rights or violating environmental protection obligations, etc. And this kind of imbalanced liabilities will further um, incent incent uh, incentivize more more corruption on the demand side, and it may incentivize more regulatory measures taken by the host states because health states will no longer worry that their regulatory measures or their acts of corruption will be uh, imposing any responsibility because this is the current approach taken by many uh, ISA tribunals. So um, a further question then arises whether ISA is proper to deal with corruption issues and what are the roles of ISA in terms of um, transnational corruption. Next slide, please. So in addition to this binary approach, um, there are some other uh, controversial issues in relation to corruption uh, uh, issues. Um, that is the tribunal's reaction to corruption suspects. And um, that is our verse uh, mentioning here. In some cases where no party has raised corruption, corrupt as ISA tribunals has taken some initiative, has taken swastbond uh, swastbond investigation on suspected corrupt acts. Um, as you can see in the mental tax, security report, and infinito gold cases, and in other cases where ISA tribunals have already uh, taken uh, have taken more than one round of examination of corruption claims, such as in Nico Resources versus uh, Bangladesh. Tribunals have already made a very clear decision on corruption claims, and they believe that uh, the, the the evidence uh, cannot prove the alleged corrupt acts. But they reopened the examination uh, of corruption claims when the respondent party submits some new evidence. So there are. Uh, in total, two rounds of examination of corruption claims in Nico versus uh, uh, Nico versus Bangladesh cases. Next slide, please. Um, the tribunal have pointed out several uh, legal bases supporting their response and re-examination of corruption claims, including transnational public policy prohibiting. Uh, corruption and the legality requirement under BIT, as well as Rule 41, Paragraph 2 and Rule 26, Paragraph 3 of the Exit Convention Arbitration Rules. Um, um, more particularly, Rule 26, Paragraph 3 uh, specify that any step taken after expiration of the applicable uh, time limit should be disregarded unless the tribunal um, decides otherwise in the special circumstances. So tribunals have believed that combating corruption is extremely important and constitutes a special circumstance and warrants a further examination. But again, there are still questions about re-examination and swastbond investigation, whether these proceedings are, are illegitimate and are consistent with international investment law. Next slide, please. Uh, so my third, the third part of my presentation intends to answer these questions by presenting several theories to explain why IAC tribunals should and could uh, deal with transnational corruption. Uh, one of the theories raised by distinguished arbitrator uh, E. Fortier uh, is Fuller's morality of law, and he proposed that using procedural tools to that require variable degrees of certainty and commitment to international anti-corruption campaign while having uh, due consideration for his duties and the rights of the parties. So uh, 
uh, according to E. Fortier, uh, he believes that uh, combating corruption is um, a, uh, it overpasses the principle uh, of um, of uh, satisfying the parties, uh, which is required by the principle of like due process, uh, fairness, and impartiality. And Thomas, uh, Professor Thomas uh, Schools also proposed that ISA um, has um, three pursuits. So effectively so resolve the dispute and admit satisfaction of the parties is not the only pursuit to further the rule of law and to implement so, uh, social values are also um, objectives of international dispute settlement. Next slide, please. Uh, I today also want to present uh, another theory that is the global governance theory to understand the relationship between ISA and the transnational corruption. Uh, in fact, there is dynamic pro process of governance theory, uh, which is developed from uh, the state governance and the initial uh, establishment of international law and then developed to international governance and we, where we have established many international organizations such as United Nations. And now uh, it has been agreed that we are now under the global governance um, stage. Um, international uh, to apply global governance in international investment law or international arbitration law, international arbitration not only has fact finding and rulemaking functions. It has received increasing consensus that international arbitration has a governance function, that it should consider the impact of their rulings on states, on persons and entities not directly represented in the case before them. I think this is also consistent with uh, uh, Professor Thomas' uh, argument about the pursuit of promotion, uh, so, uh, promoting society, uh, social values as one of objectives of international dispute settlement. Arbitrator Sophie Napier is also of the opinion that one of the central important role of arbitration in the global governance theory is to exercise this substantive discretion in the decision-making process. And this, can, uh, this includes the process of deciding certain questions that test the limits of arbitration as a dispute settlement mechanism. So deciding on transnational corruption is an example for arbitration exercising its governance function. Um, I think this concludes my presentation and because my time is also limited, uh, is, uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Yue Ming, for the wonderful presentation. I think your paper raises very important question. And let us rethink also about the function of investor state arbitration. What role it might play in the global fight against uh, corruption? I'm sure you will generate more questions on the global governance function of arbitration in the discussions. So I want to first thank all the speakers for their very insightful presentations. And now I will open the floor for questions. So the audience, if you have any questions to the speakers, please feel free to post them under the Q&A functions. Um, so um, I think I, I might start by um, asking some general questions since a few speakers have already tackled the different aspect of the ISDS reform. So I might raise um, a, a more general question to all speakers, um, whoever wanted to address them. So what do you see as the main limits of investor state dispute settlement and what do you think um, of the prospect of ISDS reform? Um, so anyone want to um, give any general comments to this? Yes, thank you, Professor Fan. Actually, uh, this is um, uh, the main research question of my PhD thesis, uh, the, the limits of ISDS in terms of uh, contributing to the legalization of uh, investment law. So uh, I, I might talk a bit about uh, the aspect, the, the, the limit of ISDS to contribute to what the EU envisaged as a more pre predictable, a more coherent investment law. And I, I think the ability of ISDS 
ICDS tribunals are quite limited. And um, one limitation comes from what I call the institutional constraint, that is the uh, international community lacks shared understanding about relevant rules. And uh, uh, in this background, if the investment tribunals uh, go beyond the, the current understanding of law to address some uh, issues or, or to facilitate the goal of predictability, it may uh, trigger backlashes. Uh, among the international community and uh, exemplified by uh, uh, actions like non-compliance or even exiting the regime. And also, I think there is also an internal constraints for investment tribunals to tackle with issues uh, Raymond and you may also discuss like uh, human rights issues and environmental protection issues uh, because uh, the, so uh, I call them polycentric issues and the investment tribunal, investment arbitration process due to the way the parties participate because they participate by uh, making uh, legal arguments rather than policy arguments. And also because not all the affected parties can participate in ISDS proceedings. So the tribunals uh, have quite limited power to address the many um, uh, uh, public issues without the uh, support of party consent. So that's uh, that's uh, what I see as the limit of investment tribunals to uh, promote the uh, legitimacy of the overall investment regime. Thank you, thank you so much, Chen Yu. And I think I think Zhao Yue's paper also briefly mentioned about the IIC reform, right? So I'm curious, what do you think? Um, that will influence the potential applicabilities of New York Convention in terms of the commercial reservation. Well, thank you, Professor uh, Fan, for this question. And I didn't have time to uh, elaborate on this issue, so I'm very happy to uh, have some words about it. Well, I think the, uh, one of the problem about ISDS reform is that we are trying to distinguish uh, investor state arbitration from the commercial arbitration mode. But uh, since now the public law paradigm seems to be more um, popular, uh, more at least among state parties or scholars. So that is a kind of like orientation of ISDS reform. We can find the palate body, um, uh, the, the, the institutional reform about the establishment of multilateral uh, investment court. And a lot of other issues, for example, as mentioned by uh, I think as mentioned by Raymond, uh, the importation of um, the public law concept of uh, proportionality test, this kind of all these kind of issues are guided by the pu public law facet of ISDS. But uh, the more we distinguish investor state arbitration from commercial arbitration, um, the more probable that some um, unsatisfied uh, country may be able to uh, undercut the applicability of commercial law instrument. Well, not only uh, the New York Convention, which is uh, the international instrument for recognition and enforcement, and also some other national instrument uh, for, for example, the annoyment of um, uh, investor state arbitration awards. And the potential problem is that on the one hand, we are trying to proceed with the ISDS reform. We are trying to establish uh, an appellate body. But on the other hand, we know that the process is very long. It's it expected that we will have have a lot of the discussion uh, before the NC Working Group 3, before uh, I think next year or uh, the year bef uh, after next year. But during this period, we can find a lot of states, they are, they, they are trying to distinguish the two kind of arbitrations and they are trying to extend uh, the scope of review over investment treaty arbitration and the ground for this extended review is the public facet of ISDS. So it seems to me like the, the ISDS reform now is kind of paradox. On the one hand, it's public law paradigm, but on the other hand, it risks undercutting the enforceability and final and bending effect of uh, investor state arbitration awards. So that is a point that I focus on in my recent research. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also uh, quickly turn to perhaps um, Yue Ming. Um, what do you think are 
the limits of uh, the current investment law to deal with transnational economic crimes? And, um, you know, and again, what do you see as a prospect? Um, I think um, the question, the problem is that international, because uh, we established the international treaty law, mostly established by like the consensus between and agreement between the uh, state parties. So most of like the rules are based on the uh, BIT or the or FTA. They are all the consent consent from the state sovereign state parties. And the problem of transnational economic law is that many states, uh, I would say like maybe most states, they are reluctant to uh, to give the consent to international arbitrations or or other kind of like dispute settlement mechanism to deal with this kind of like economic crimes. Uh, this not only this is not only like economic issues because it re it concerns the adjudication adjudication issues of the domestic uh, court and domestic states. So uh, many states have reserved this has reserved their rights to deal with any corruption related issues within their domestic law in their domestic systems. And this is also um, the recent development as the, the paper I published uh, um, that uh, increasing number of states have explicitly regulated that uh, we do not agree to submit any investment obtained by corruption to be uh, for arbitration. So in a, like uh, like maybe 10 years ago, there was no such kind of like provision in the BIT or the FTA. And on that basis, the uh, ISA tribunals have made some questions based on the substantiated corruption. Uh, that is the World Duty Free versus Kenya. But now, uh, now that many states have a very clear rule that uh, arbitration do not have jurisdiction over any investment related uh, corruption related investment. So I I think maybe in the future um, arbitration uh, maybe in the future there may, may not be many uh, like investment disputes and um, where uh, where the tribunals can adjudicate uh, something on corruption. But uh, why this is the recent development, but I don't think this is a um, a good one. Uh, also, in my dissertation, I also proposed that states should uh, should consider giving more power and giving more authority to arbitration to deal with this transnational corruption, especially when transnational corruption is very difficult to take to deter, and they may raise many like um, regulatory distortions because. Uh, uh, for example, um, um, both the like invest the home state of the investor and the host state of the uh, the host state, they will they both will argue that they have the authority to address this kind of corruption issues. So, um, the jurisdiction, um, extraterritorial jurisdiction issues may also be one of the um, uh, may also be one of the future distortions uh, if. Uh, if states uh, limited their consent to address corruption issues within domestic system instead of international arbitration system. Um, and in fact, we have many scholars that propo also propose that international arbitration is one of the um, one of the available tools to address transnational corruption, um, even though the current approach is not satisfactory. Uh, but we will see how 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 ISA tribunals will address um, um, the future corruption related issues in a few years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuemin. Um, so now I saw we have also a question from the audience. Uh, I might turn to Lucas to, to address that. Uh, so the audience asks, would you agree that the applicable application of national security exception clauses in BIAs can handle international investment arbitrations brought by the pandemic? Lucas? So there's two cases that were brought against India fairly recently. I actually wrote about this in a paper I published in TDN. Uh, I think it was the CC Devis case, another case which is um, a Mauritius investor, uh, the, the Deutsche Telekom case, even CC Davis is the Mauritius case. And they had uh, national security clauses in both of their, the relevant investment uh, treaties. But the tribunals generally interpret them uh, fairly restricted. Um, I think Deutsche Telekom was much more restrictive in the CC Devis case. Uh, and the real issue is that the, the measures taken have to be basically primarily to deal with kind of an essential interest of the state. It's quite a high bar. So I think some of the pandemic measures that were taken, uh, curfews, restrictions, so on, 
you could say this, but some of the other ones like they're saying about toll roads, um, maybe restrictions and compensation, uh, it's, it's a bit harder to see how they are necessarily to do with the national security of the state, which is already quite a high bar. And it's also worth pointing out that some of those treaties already have measures to do with health, um, to do with, you know, it's all right for this, take measures that protect human health, that protect human life. So tribunals might say that they're exclusive. You can't regulate this. this the fact that it's regulated in a separate issue with, with separate rules means that it doesn't come under the national security um, exception. So I don't think it's I, I don't think it's the silver bullet that people think it is. It certainly wasn't the silver bullet that India thought it was in those cases where they thought it was clicked up that it was you know, to do with um, things to do with satellites in one case and they needed the bandwidth of the military and so on. They thought it was quite clear cut and, and it wasn't. Um, so I think it very much depends, in all honesty, basically which arbitrators you get, how they want to interpret it, um, and which measures they are. And it doesn't help, of course, that the governments have flip-flopped a lot. First they say no masks, then they say masks, then they say back. So the measures have changed a lot. So it's quite hard for a government then to say, oh, this was a national security measure, but we changed it six months later, then we changed it again. So uh, yeah, it, it remains to be seen, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucas. Um, I, I also have a question, uh, I think, for Raymond. Perhaps, as you know, that the overlap now that you mentioned in international arbitration human rights has also intensified with the recent adoption of the Hague rules on business and human rights arbitration. Well, it's probably mainly designed to, you know, to address this gap in remedies for companies and their stakeholders to resolve the business human rights dispute. But I wonder whether you think that states might actually include arbitration under Hague rules in the investment treaty or agreements? And do you think that would be an effective solution to address human rights issues in investment arbitration? Thank you, Raymond. Thank you for your question. Um, short answer is yes, I do. I do think this is a very good way to incorporate investor responsibility. And in my paper, I talk about this in more details. I argue that, you know, there are two ways to um, incorporate investor responsibilities <coughs> in investment treaty arbitration. The first one is to expressly uh, stipulate a provision or many provisions that um, addressing uh, binding investment obligations. This is the case with uh, <coughs> Nigeria and Morocco better investment treaty, which was conducted in 2016. Uh, and that treaty is a remarkable development because it contains many provisions in binding terms which require the investor to uh, fulfill many um, human rights obligations among others. And the other way to do this is to incorporate the existing, you know, international soft law, law norms and their international human rights law uh, into investment treaties. And one example I have in mind is the Netherlands model of bilateral investment treaty and I would like to um, draw attention to its Article 23. Um, I quote, a tribunal in deciding on the amount of compensation is, it ex is it expected to take into account non-compliance by the investor with its commitments under the United Nations guiding principle on human rights and on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Um, so this is also a very remarkable uh, example of incorporating you know, external software obligations in investment treaties. And in this way, I think it can really provide the teeth that can really bite to hold the investor accountable you know, with real consequences in the investment treaty arbitration. And if this can happen with the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights, I think there's no reason that it cannot happen with the hate rules on business and human rights arbitration, either in investment treaties or alternatively in investment contract. And I also think that, uh, relatively speaking, it might be more uh, a, a more pragmatic way to include this investment contract between the private investor and the whole state, because generally the whole state will obtain more leverage to um, to force this clause into the investment contract. And I think these are, these are provide, these are development are very important because they can provide the uh, effective means to enforce investor obligation, investment treaty arbitration. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raymond. And um, so it's already about time that we um, conclude our session. Uh, I wanted to thank all the speakers for the wonderful presentations and uh, insightful discussions. And also thank you for all the audiences for uh, attending our events. Special thanks goes to our behind the scenes administrators, uh, Fiyang Chua, um, Wen Chen and Hannah Jess, who provided very valuable support for the event. So you're also very welcome to stay with us to the session, our last session today on the finance and currency, which is starting at 4.30. Please also stay tuned for CBEL Global Network virtual conference panels that will be held every two weeks until October. So to continue our discussions on ISDS, we will also host a conference on the present and future of ISDS reforms on the 17th of September to discuss the ongoing efforts of um, ISDF reform from different institutions, including representative from ICSID and the Ancestral Working Group 3 as perspective, and we also um, get prospect about public opinion on ISDF through some experimental, um, behavior experiments. So I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone, and I uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you.